Hello, everyone, and welcome today to another episode of Celebrity Customer Experience Riffs with me, Jill Raff, where we riff on anything and everything, employee experience to customer experience, because I am truly obsessed with employee experience creating outstanding customer experience. I believe your business will increase its revenue by engaging committed and loyal employees and customers. And of course, it begins from the inside out, which is why my framework is called the inside out framework, because I guarantee you, and you will see from today's guest, that outstanding employee experience will create outstanding customer experience. Today, we're gonna to be speaking with a guest who truly models and lives the EX to CX philosophy from employee experience to customer experience where both the internal customer, the employees and the companies who he leads all benefit greatly. So before I bring on my guest, I just wanna remind everyone if you're watching, comment uh, live. This is actually being done by recording but we will see it, you can tag me. And if you're uh, watching the replay, which most of you do, go ahead and comment there as well to be involved in the conversation. So I'm gonna bring on our guest today alone. Can you hear me? Hi. I can hear you. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Your voice is very soft. So as much as you can lean in, that would be great. I'll try, I'll do my best. Perfect, there you're better already. Thank you so much. My guest today is Alon Barshani, who spent 25 years as CEO at HP Indigo. Currently Alon is serving as chairman of the board to several Israeli-based high-tech companies, ranging from one called Redefine Meat, which produces plant-based meats, to Twine, who is creatively and innovative, who's creating an innovative and sustainable method of dyeing yarns saving hundreds of gallons, thousands actually, of gallons of water in the process. It's very fascinating. I had the pleasure of going and really seeing how that works. And as an ex-fashion designer and, and knitwear in particular, it's really amazing the work that's happening there. Uh, alone, um, you really, I think anyone who's ever worked with you thinks of you as being the, the person who links everyone, who really connects everyone, who creates that experience. So I would love for everyone to learn from you and, and let's start a little bit at the background, kind of your journey, uh, taking you into the printing world and then we'll get to what's kind of led you up to what you're doing now. Okay, I, I, um, I reached the printing world, I would say rather randomly. The printing world by far and large is a, aggregate of hundreds of thousands of small family owned businesses. Um, I did not grow up in a printing world by any means. I reached it a bit by chance in the mid nineties after I'd worked for 10 years in a rather large global chemical company. And when I left that company, I was looking for something new and different. And I heard about this company Indigo, which was still a startup in Israel, trying to innovate and move the very traditional conservative analog world into the digital uh, world. Uh, Indigo was founded by a very charismatic, uh, innovative genius called Benny Landa. And I joined it pretty early days. Um, and on the one hand, there was a great buzz and a lot of excitement. On the other hand, trying to disrupt the traditional industry with a breakthrough technology is very difficult. So the first few years was a lesson in survival, in dealing with very upset customers that spent a lot of money on something that didn't always work, but um, one of the good things about a crisis is that you learn a lot from it and what doesn't kill you makes you strong. So I guess that's my background into how I entered the pretty fascinating world of printing and spent 25 years there. Mm, thank you. So what was it in your journey, which is very interesting background that made you realize the importance of focusing on the employee and the customer experience side of business as the method really of long term success for both the internal side, right, the people side of the businesses while growing the company itself exponentially? Well, I think, first of all, I'm Israeli, and as an Israeli, we all go to the army and when you're 18 and you spend a few years there. And I had the opportunity to be an officer. Um, and at the end, you're thrown into sort of a leadership position when you're 20, knowing very little. And at the end, you realize that everything's around people and trust and being there for 
each other. So fundamentally, anybody in Israel who spent time in the army understands that technology is important and processes are important. At the end, it's all around people and, and trust. Um, I will say, though, that the, the beauty of the printing industry is that it is an aggregate of family-owned businesses, relatively small. And when you deal with family businesses, the dynamics are very different from, from corporate life. Um, people are born into the business. Their parents, grandparents founded the business. Their spouses, uh, kids, etc., are in the business. So there's a view of long-term, of trust, of relationships. And very quickly, you, you sort of understand that uh, in order to be successful, you need to create a very, very long-term win-win, which is all built on trust. It's also a lot of fun because you're actually not just doing business with people, you're getting into their family to, to a large extent. So if you have the personality, um, if you enjoy that, it's very emotional, uh, like most families, um, but it's also very, very rewarding. And you know, the beauty is that uh, you get to know the people, the families, the businesses on a business level, but also on a personal, emotional level. And when it works, it's it's uh, good business, but also just a lot of fun, very rewarding, very emotional. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is creating that work family in the business place in particular. And what you just talked about demonstrates the importance of, you know, what it's like when you're in a small company and that is based off of a family. So it's recreating that feeling, even when you're not specifically a family uh, unit or a family business, but creating that feeling in the workplace that I think makes it so successful. And I love that. And I just want to highlight a word, uh, what, a, a philosophy and important strategy that you talked about as well, which is about trust. It's the, the third E in my E3 formula, which is engage, uh, educate, engage, and entrust, and how important that is to empower your people and to actually trust them. And I, I do think that's something that you really excel at um, in the workplace when you're leading people. Um, okay. Yeah. It's it's evident from everything that I've read and, and seen as well. So, Alon, what currently do you feel like are the pressing problems that you're seeing right now in the workplace and the companies that you're working with? Um, I think it's been around for a few years, and, and actually, ironically, the corona probably accelerated that. Um, today, it's it's a market where you can't find people. I mean, the Israel high-tech um, world is growing amazingly fast. Uh, it's accelerated over the last year. There are endless ideas. There's literally endless cash available for investment. And at the end, people are competing for human resources that are talented, that are passionate. How do you hire the best people? How do you keep them interested and engaged and wanting to stay with you more than two or three years and not just move on? Huge challenge. Um, so in a very competitive world, how do you really build a team um, with the employees? Obviously, the younger generation looks at things a little bit differently, probably not that differently than when we were young, but the world has changed. People are interested in uh, experiences. They're interested in emotions. They're interested in working for a company that has values, that cares. And I found that one of the big attractions of a company was like Indigo was actually the fact that we were working with real people as customers, unlike selling software or selling to a purchasing manager in a corporate, we were selling to John and Deepak and Octavio and, you know, names around the world. And that was very exciting for people because part of the job was traveling, hosting people here, getting to know, different cultures and um, I think it was a win-win for everybody, but it was not just work. It was being part of a much bigger organization. We can talk a little bit later about the dynamics, how it's done. It doesn't happen by chance. You have to, you have to work on it. You have to have a framework, both emotionally and process. 
Exactly. And we will circle back to that because that is something that I think would be really important for people to learn and to have those takeaways that they can do is more of that approach. So you've identified some of the problems and I, I agree the clients that I'm speaking to or the staffing is the biggest problem. Retention is the most costly problem that they have creating that culture. And um, so what, what do you think of the consequences of seeing these organizations because of the struggles that they're facing if they don't really address the problem from a cultural point of perspective of, of really focusing on their people? Look, you can measure, you know, attrition, you can measure effectiveness. I, I personally, I might be in, a, in my a minority today, I don't buy this working from home concept. Maybe it's because I'm Israeli, maybe because the army doesn't work from home or, you know, for me, innovation, great companies, bonding doesn't happen by Zoom. Customer experience doesn't happen by Zoom. Um, at least in the industries I enjoy working, there are probably industries where, where it works fine. But if you really want an intimate customer experience long term, you don't get married by Zoom, you don't have children by Zoom. So <laughs> work can happen partially by Zoom, but at the end you need the human interaction. And that's where innovation happens. So I think the challenge today is absolutely leverage technology, but also remember that people have evolved over millions of years and they want the human touch. The fundamental you know, human touch points is family, tribes, etc. cetera. Um, again, for certain industries, it may be different, but for customers that are family businesses or you know, the, where the experience is at the end is live, I think that's that's critical to have this culture of getting together, having fun, working hard, playing hard. Yeah, working hard, playing hard, absolutely. And and I and I think you really touched on the point that it, it really affects the innovation, of course, which is critical for continuing to grow, but um, affecting the productivity and the engagement, ultimately the results of the company, right? That I'm guessing that's probably the biggest impact that it really negatively affects affects productivity. Um, look, I, I, I can't quantify, I can just share my experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, people buy from people they trust, especially in the industries where I work at, where you sell pretty expensive piece of, uh, piece of capital goods, and then you provide services, in our case, Inc. In other cases, it could be other products for a long, long time. So this trust is fundamental. It's not transactional relationships, and, and customers have choice. And sometimes they'll go with the technology, which is not the best, because they trust the, the people. As, you, as mm. long as you let them down, it's, it's fine. And, and the real important things is what happens in times of trouble. Um, you know, a crisis like we had in 2008 and 9, a crisis like Corona, what do you do? By the way, it's the same for employees. Do you fire employees or do you retain them? Do the managers take a bigger cut in compensation than the employees? Do you help out your customers or do you squeeze them? And actually, the best way to form long-term uh, healthy relationships is to act in a fair and caring way during a crisis. Yeah, I, I think we saw that very much. And one of the questions I, I was going to ask you about, which, um, you know, I feel strongly that it's just very obvious that COVID has changed the way businesses behave, the way that they engage with their um, employees. And it's, it's very different from pre-pandemic days. And so I was curious to know how you think the pandemic has actually changed the way companies are doing business now, both with their employees and their customers. Again, I, I probably have, I don't think COVID is that different than previous crises. It's a crisis for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe in certain countries that are not used to going through a crisis beyond, you know, a recession here or there, it's right. sort of stark, but I would give it a year or two. In Israel, we live from crisis to crisis for, I would say 2,000, 3,000 years, but you know, let's say decades. <laughs> and the crisis comes and the crisis goes and things change. But you know, I think technology is, is changing rapidly. And I mm. would say technology is, is what's changing certain things. And the COVID is just one example of maybe certain things that accelerated. I don't think it, changed, it changes the mega trends. I don't think mm -hmm. it changes the fundamental human behavior. So you know, we now have 
have acceleration of remote capabilities, of doing things by Zoom, of better technology, which is fantastic, would have happened anyway. Now people are a little bit more open to it. I think the same you know, opportunities and challenges we had three years ago are, are there today. And at the end, mm -hmm. I think two years from now, we will look at COVID, we will have learned. Will it fundamentally change the general business? I don't think so. Will it have accelerated certain industries and maybe accelerated the death of other ind industries? Absolutely, but that's sort of the, the cycle, circle of life. Right, exactly. So you don't, wouldn't advise businesses necessarily to go about business in a different way due to this impact um, or the shutdowns or things that have happened? I, I think you should never take anything for granted and you shouldn't assume that what's worked for the last 10, 20, or even two years is gonna work in the future. You always that's have right. to think what happens when the crisis happens. And when a crisis happens, it's more important in some ways how you enter the crisis than even what you do in the short term. Of course, you have to preserve cash, you have to preserve your customers, but if you enter a crisis and you're unhealthy and your customers don't love you and your employees don't care, you're gonna be in a very bad position. If you have loyalty and if you have a healthy business and healthy is not just customers and employees, it's cash flow, it's processes, it's a lot of things. It's probably an opportunity because there'll be others that are competing with you that are not in as strong as position as you are. So you can emerge from this crisis even better. So I'm not saying ignore COVID, of course, you have to analyze what's going on, but COVID doesn't change, you know, the big problems we faced before of environment, of rapid population growth, of crazy things we're doing to this planet. These these are things that happened way before COVID, and they're much bigger problems than, mm -hmm. than COVID. So, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. So let's just circle back for a minute, like, you know, in terms of how you help the companies solve these problems. And, and if you could share a little bit about your approach uh, so others can learn the practical strategies of how to implement things that they can implement now in order to create that employee connection with each other and so that when they have that great experience it gets passed on to your customers i don't know where it starts i mean for me actually creating a great employee experience is also around trust which has to do with the values of the company and how you show up and you know a lot of small things but i will connect the customer to the employee so if employees understand that customers are really the most important element of the company, I think that goes a long way into creating trust with employees, excitement, fun, etc. And to do that, you first of all need to measure objectively customer experience, which I can talk about in a second, but you also need to sort of lead by example and to create the emotional bond. So for example, many companies do uh, events or lectures to their uh, employees about what's going on. For us at Indigo, for example, it's always very important to bring as many customers as we can in front of the employees. So when we had assemblies of all the employees, we tried to bring customers to talk, not only about the good things, also about the bad things. We, we tried when we had events with customers, not just to go to dinner with the management or the salespeople, but to bring in the R&D people, the operations, uh, people and when I would go visit customers, which was a big portion of my time, I would share my summaries broadly. I know hundreds of people in the company read it, not just the good things, the bad things, the anecdotes, you know, the emotional parts as well. So it's, it's around creating a culture. There are also many ways of doing it in a more formal way. We had customer advisory boards a few times a year where we would sit for three, four days in a closed room for nine or 10 hours and go through strategy, competition, technology. And then in the evening, we would go out and have fun. And we do that three, four times a year. That's top priority. And you know, I personally would sit there and, and most of the Indigo management and, and we would never you know, give that up for anything. It was the most important thing. So advisory boards, we had a fantastic user group of thousands of customers, which was driven by customers, but we, we supported it, so you know that's another sort of pillar. And then we had a very robust process of me measuring customer satisfaction, NPS, Net Promoter Score, 
actually thousands and thousands a week with an online tool. In the beginning, we used to send faxes once a year and take a third party to do all the analysis. But in today's world, you can do it online, you can do it live, and you want to get the feedback not just from the owner, but from the operator. Um, and then you have to act and close the loop on every single one. So it's a combination of showing you care and how you as a manager show up and prove that customers are the most important because people follow your example, but that's not enough. You also need the data, you need the robust processes, you need to plan your time and to say X percent of my time, in my case it was a third, a third of my time I'm gonna spend with customers. That was like a value and everybody in the company knew a third of the time I'm with customers. And the customers then created that really uh, deep connection with you. It's one of my tagline of transform transactions into interaction. So they, they weren't just creating that transaction with you. They really interacted. You interacted with them, creating ultimately the relationships. And it's the relationships, it's just what, not, as you pointed out before, not only will help customers buy from you, but keep keep coming back to you and having being a repeat customer and referring to you. Um, yeah, it's not you because with all respect, you know, I'm one person out of thousands. And what's really important is what everybody does day to day. And, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you can set an example and you can put the customer metrics as top importance, even beyond financials. And honestly, one of the things I advise people to do is to sort of simulate once once in a while take yourself out of a meeting conversation and try to measure how many times have you talked about operating profit revenue growth share and how many people have you talked about how many times have you talked about customers and when you talk about customers you have a face in mind it could be jill mm -hmm. it could be kathy it could be joseph but you have a real customer in front of you and unfortunately especially in corporate life 99% of the time you're talking about things other than the customer. And for me, it's shocking that, that smart people can come together, spend two days and never mention customer. And when that yeah. happens, in my opinion, you're, you're in deep trouble, but it happens a lot. So if that happens, it's a warning sign. As a manager, you better stop for a second and say, why am I not talking more about customers and less about other things? Huge, huge takeaway. I hope everyone heard that. You need to be talking a third of the time, at least about the customers, have someone in mind. It's not just a numbers game, you know, and I, I know this is a big problem and I hear this a lot that especially corporations, they just talk about the bottom line. They want to know what's the bottom line numbers and the bottom line is not your numbers. Yes, of course, as a business to stay alive, it's your numbers, but the bottom line is your people who will naturally create those numbers for you. And the, and the bottom line is those relationships uh, with your customers and your employees who are creating that experience for your customers and getting the feedback after all. Um, so much gold, oh my gosh. Um, really, really important um, tactics and, and not tactics, real strategies and just a, a mindset. What I think of as a, not just a mindset, but true value set of focusing on and your people, your internal and external customers. Um, and I know one of the other things that's done here in Israel is y'all talk about it as a fun day. So can you talk a little bit about what you do internally with your with your employees themselves to keep them feeling like they're important, that they are responsible for the success of what happens in the company, that they are actually a part of the accountability for actually creating the ownership for the company so that they work for the company in the same way? Well, this is the reality. I mean, a company is its people. So it's not a slogan. It's not like saying we need to make our people feel as if. Our people are the company. There's no value to the company beyond it. So, um, you know, how do you do it? Uh, you know, fun days are, you know, one way of many, but every day should be a fun day. If, if you get to work, and you're not having fun, you know, people have bad days, you have bad periods, but I've always told people, if if you get to work and you're not passionate about what you're doing, if you're not having fun, if you're not growing, you should start thinking, you know, why are you there? It could be a change in the company, it could be a break, and it could be, you know, leaving somewhere else because you're not connected emotionally 
anymore. So for me, life is not worth living without passion. And if you're spending a big percent of your life at work, which is what we do mostly, you better have passion at work. You better appreciate the people you work with. You, 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 you should like your direct manager. You should like your group. You should appreciate the value of the, of the company. Um, and as I said before, companies are measured primarily in bad times. When things are good and everybody's making money and the economy is growing and and uh, it's hard to hire, everybody's going to be nice to the employees. The question is what happens at a company level or a financial level when things are tough, but also personally. What you know? What is the employee uh, going to expect when things are bad? Because everybody goes through bad periods in life. So you know, I, uh, my philosophy is you always you do the right thing and you do it humbly and beneath the radar, you don't talk about it, you don't make a big noise about it. When you do the right thing, you create a culture where there's trust. And at the end, this mutual commitment pays off also business-wise, but it's just the right thing to do. And as a company, again, your goal is not to maximize shareholder value or the stock price. I mm. totally object to that. And you know, you're responsible for your employees, for your environment, for your community. And if you keep that in mind and think long term um, and act consistently, it's not just slogans, people will feel that. And, and as long as, you know, they can, they'll be with you. And once in a while, you know, people leave and people rotate. That's that's fine. It's a free, it's a free world. It's, it's uh, for me, it's, it sounds trivial. And I've seen many companies do that, but I've also seen, unfortunately, many companies which are fully transactional. And um, and at the end, they survive, and some of them are, are even very successful for the midterm. I, I question their ability to add great value or to innovate or to do great things long term. There are always exceptions, of course. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. And I think... Um, Besides so much of, of everything you said, I hope everyone's really taking notes, but the mutual agreement, I think that is really key. And I just want to stress that it's mutual. It works both ways. It's not just the, the, the company, the corporation having those expectations of the employees, but the employee should naturally have that expectation and both have a mutual agreement on what is expected to be done and how they should behave and what, how they contribute and innovate and are productive in their positions. Um, so much great, great insight. Thank you. So Alon, just for some quick takeaways, what do you think there are some, some easy things that maybe companies could do right now without, of course, having someone come in as a consultant, as advisor, as fresh eyes to hear and see what's going on and give advice ultimately is the way to to grow and to, to see the problems and correct them. But what might be a few ideas uh, just for quick things that companies you feel could implement to just start to make that shift? Look, first of all, you need to define customer satisfaction or customer growth or any anything you want as a, as a metric. People use balanced scorecards, people have KPIs. If you have customer, um, focused KPIs that are measured, that employees know are important, that helps a lot. In parallel, I think you have to work on creating the emotional bond by visits, by sharing experiences, by videos, by by hosting trips. I mean, it really depends on on the industry, um, and it's leading by uh, it's leading by example. And then at the end, it's bringing people that really care about customers in those positions, which are very customer facing. But as you mentioned at the beginning, you also have internal customers. Uh, we've talked more about external customers here, but again, if there's a mindset of, of respect and caring, not for what you're doing, but for what the other side is actually receiving, I think you start creating the culture. But again, culture and emotions are, are fantastic. They can't replace a robust process of defining goals, measuring, reporting, closing the loop, correcting. So I would say these are the two sides. And what I said before, make make sure that in all your internal meetings, any reviews about service, about operations, about R&D, about future roadmap, you're thinking customer and not only you know, the traditional internal metrics. 
Very, that's awesome. Great, great input. Um, thank you for that. So um, I think I know the answer to this, but what do you love most about what you do? You know the answer? You should tell me because I don't know the answer. What really? do I love? <laughs> well, no, I want to hear from you and then I'll tell you what I'm thinking. First of all, I love my family most, but uh, oh, no. in work, I, <laughs> I like the diversity of experiences and of people I've met through the years who have become my friends, customers, distributors, uh, partners that are a big part of my life. Um, you know, and over time, you know how you can run your business and, and still, you know, do the right thing for the business and their shareholders, but, but, but literally also have this friendship, which is the fundamental elements of family business. I've had the pleasure of working with channels and customers that are second, third generation. And of course, they're running a business, they have responsibility, but at the end, it's part of the family. I, I enjoy this interaction. I think I'd be pretty terrible at doing anything which is more transactional, which doesn't have this intimate connection, which doesn't have the face-to-face, -face, which is all Zoom. And, and, and there are roles like that and you know jobs like that, which some people do fantastically. So, that's my answer, but you tell me what the right answer is. <laughs> well, that's the answer. So there's no right or wrong, but that's that is really what I thought is is knowing you and knowing the customers, how customers have responded, and just reading things uh, that have been written about you. That it's about the relationships that I see clearly. You have that passion. You love that connection with people that you're sharing business with. And um, to me, that's the part that I see that that lights you up and that lights up the customers that that creates that connection and makes people uh, want to continue to do business is that is that genuine relationship, that genuine caring about that. So that that's what I see. I would, and, I would add to, um, I would add to that. I would add to that the diversity because yes, yeah, I've had the opportunity to work around the world. And to right. see how customers from different countries around the globe get to know each other and help each other. And actually, if you're based in Atlanta, you might be a little bit hesitant to share your secrets with somebody that's also in Atlanta or even in New York, but probably mm -hmm. less than somebody in Sheffield or in uh, Düsseldorf. So this network of people from different religions, different skin colors, different mm -hmm. cultures coming together it's very rewarding because that also drives a lot of innovation. And for me, again, that's what gives the spice to the life, this interaction. So it's relationship, but again, the fortune of being very diverse and being in Israel sort of by definition, you're in a pretty diverse part of the world. So that probably is part of it as well. Yeah, I love that. And um, boy, I'm so in alignment with that. 100% diversity is the spice of life and makes things interesting. And I think always, uh, better, no matter what it is we're trying to do, you're going to achieve and succeed at a higher level when you have that that amazing diversity of thought, uh, cultures, what what we what we do, what we look like, we come from. That's all all influences influences that. Um, and you know, one question I often ask is, you know, what is someone's superpower that helps the clients the most? And I know you're going to say, I don't have a superpower. I don't, um, but. I think the superpower here is really asking questions and listening to your customers. I mean, that's what I, I hear from you is that you're really there to learn about what their experience is and in doing so are able to help them the most by uh, really being present for them. Would you agree? Yeah, but I think also when you go to customers, especially when you're more senior executive and Sometimes the salespeople will sort of choose the customer that are happy and they'll all say the good stuff. And, and uh, for me, it's like you actually want to hear, you want to hear good stuff, but you especially want to hear what's not working well, what can we do better? What's competition doing better? So some of that is in a formal meeting. A lot of that is just, you know, over, over wine. It's amazing how alcohol frees up the mind and the tongue. So get, get things right. out and uh, tell us what we can do better. And then if you don't do anything, you don't improve, your next visit is not going to be too much fun. But if you've listened and improved, you're not, you're never perfect and you never solve everything. But I think that goes a long way. And by the way, also be honest with the customer because some, sometimes good customers will ask you, what can I learn? What am I doing wrong? 
where can I, you know, talk to somebody who's doing better than I can. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a four-way street, it's sort of putting things on the table and trying to improve and learn from mistakes. Yeah, that's it. I, I always encourage people too. I say, you know, hearing uh, what I what we did well is important, so we know to continue those things. But as important, or even more importantly, is to say, what could we do better? What would you like to see instead? Where did we get it wrong? And then, as you mentioned earlier on, I think it's it's not just knowing that, but it's taking action on that information because you can have the data. And I think a lot of companies do the NPS scores, and I mean, um, uh, net promoter scores, NPS store scores, and get all this data, but then they don't really act on it. Um, so I think that, as you said, is um, really at the end of the day, the crux of, of what's going to make any changes happen in your business. So just one last question. Um, I'm always curious to hear from people, and I know uh, most people, it, it's usually quite diverse, but where do you get your inspiration? Like, I know you travel a lot, but are there certain, is it like a favorite book or a musician or a quote or someone that you feel keeps you motivated and keeps you going, inspires you? It's not one thing, it's life. Every day is an adventure. and uh... Right. I like to read, I like to travel, I like taking weeds out of my garden, um, I like playing tennis, so I like being with my family, my friends, there's, there's not one, there's not one source, it's, it's realizing that life is short, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you can, uh, you can basically, in many ways, control what you want to do, and uh, you don't, you know, as long as you have good health, all the rest is is up to you. So I'm I'm inspired by a lot of things and by, by people I meet. Um, and once in a while, you have to slow down to try to find a new idea because when you're rushing all the time, it's it's very hard. So definitely over the year, you know, books probably and travel I'm listed the top places mm -hmm. where I'm inspired. Yeah, living that full life. And I love that you included in there picking weeds in your garden. Because that is the kind of the, the downtime where your brain can just rest and not and not be going and and the mix of just, just living life fully. And that, that's a huge takeaway right there, if nothing else, even beyond everything else, to really take it take it all in. Well, alone, thank you so much. This really was fantastic. And I know so many people will be able, will be enthralled in hearing about the experiences and your insights, but also really have some key takeaways, some great uh, strategies and ideas that truly can be implemented. Let's hope that everyone not only writes down some great things, but as we talked about, take action, uh, put that into your business. Just try one thing at a time. You have to start somewhere. So thank you again for your time and your insight. And it's always a pleasure. I appreciate you. I'm going to go to my garden and pick some weeds now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. So that was amazing. Um, I hope everyone will leave some comments, ask questions. Be sure to tag me uh, or Alone Barshani uh, on LinkedIn. And I just want to say uh, thanks for joining today. We will be back next week with another episode of Celebrity Customer Experience. And um, let us know if there's something in particular that you want, a special guest. But we look forward to joining you again to continue to help everyone improve their, their customer experience through their employee experience as well. Thanks so much.